All right, welcome to Christian Overcomers, and thank you for joining us for this Bible study. I'm Pastor Ben Heath, and I'm going to take you through a chapter in the book of Ezra today. This great book not only gives us the history of how the Israelites went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, it also gives us a type and an example of how we are to build the many-member body of Christ today. So I hope you enjoy this study. May God bless you. Ezra chapter 10. America needs to annul its marriage with pagan leftist ideologies. You know, back in biblical times, they were called pagans. They were called heathens. But today, they call themselves liberals and progressives. You know, they make it sound as though they're really caring, they're, they're generous, you know, by the word liberal. And by progressive, they make themselves sound as though they're going to advance civilization to a, a higher order, a higher calling. But it's the same old paganism. It's the same old abominations that the pagans were doing way back in the when in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament times. And we're dealing with them here in America today. We're dealing with earth worshipers. We're dealing with um child people who are promoting child sacrifice, i.e. abortion. We're dealing with people who are supporting all kinds of sexual immorality and depravity. And, and, and ba basically, if you go back and you look at all the ancient gods of Egypt, of Assyria, of Babylon, uh, all those pagan societies, you're going to see those same gods reflected in society today, oftentimes under different names. And... Um, it, we can see it today. What we're seeing with all these protests and stuff against Donald Trump, it, it, is, it is a religious war. It is good versus evil. It is paganism versus Christianity. What, what's going on is we're having such a revolt of, of the pagan left the leftists or liberals, they are revolting against our uh, countering their deluge of paganism upon America with the election of Donald Trump. And and they are panicking, they're scared, and they wanna they wanna take they wanna try to uh, keep that wave of um, uh, the, the floods of ungodliness they want to keep those floods spreading across our nation. But now we've got people in place that are trying to stop the flood. That are trying to stop the destruction. And um and we see that they're crying, they're wailing, they're they're going to, you know, protesting at the at the White House, protesting in different cities. You know, they're they're protesting um Donald Trump enforcing current immigration laws as though it's the end of the world for them. But the, the, the reason why they do not want to protect our borders, and this goes along with building a wall. You know, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah have to do with the restoration of God's nation. We're going to get into the scriptures here in a little bit. You'll see the, the slides here change. But these this book has has to do with the rest, you know, you, I guess you could say make America great again. In type, that's what the book of Ezra is about. Making the nation of God's people great again, restoring their nation, bringing back their culture away from paganism, away from all of this ungodly stuff. And they don't want that to happen. They want the floodgates to be open. They, they want to change the image of America into the image 
of the ancient old pagan gods of old. Anyways, hey, let's get into the scriptures here. Uh, well, first of all, I'm just going to recap. In Ezra chapter 9, we found out that many of these people that were returning with Ezra to go back to Jerusalem had actually married strange pagan women. I mean, think about that. The very sin that got them that that got them into captivity or that caused God to punish them for 70 years they were they were already repeating as they were on their way back it's just unthinkable the lesson we want to learn from this is as we have a chance of restoration in America today we don't want to repeat the same mistakes that got us uh presidents like obama and uh and and other punishments we don't want to repeat those mistakes. We want to learn from them. But anyways, so they had married these strange wives, these pagan wives, and there's a warning in the book of Proverbs against this because they would turn the heart of that man and then ultimately the society, the nation, away from God. Proverbs 5, verse 3, for the lips of a strange woman, this is a foreign woman, a pagan woman, drop as a honeycomb. Her mouth is smoother than oil. She's so seductive. It sounds so sweet and it sounds so nice. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. You know what? That is where America is going. Where America was going. But like I said, with the election of Donald Trump, the war is on. We're, we're trying to turn the tides back. We're trying to separate ourselves from the pagan ideologies of one worldism, of globalism, of open borders that have been destroying our country, that that ha, that has brought us down or close to hell, if you would. Think about this. Her end is as bitter as wormwood. It sounds good at the beginning. You know, paganism sounds great. Good promises for everybody. Just live the way you want to. Have, you know, all the sexual satisfaction as you want unlawfully. And, and, and enjoy whatever, however you want to express yourself. You know, you women uh, out there, you radical feminists. Hey, you know, just really you know, build up your hatreds towards man and demand that you be treated exactly like a man. And demand that there are no differences whatsoever, no God-given differences. And you know where that'll get us? To an end that is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword, it, 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 it's in a sense, it's committing national suicide and a, a spiritual suicide for those who get involved in the leftist pagan ideologies. That's why we see these pro again. That's why we see these protests. That's why we see the stuff going on is because. Uh, that's that's where we were going. We almost went to hell as a nation. And if we're not careful, we will go there. But I believe God in his grace and his mercy has extended, has, has done something miraculous with the election of Donald Trump. I mean, we finally have people who know what the heck they're doing. And not only that, but people who respect God, who respect our Christian heritage. 
yeah, yeah, of course, Donald Trump's not perfect. I know he's been married three times. Uh, he's said some crude things in the past. But David, King David, a man after God's own heart, was an adulterer and a murderer. So God can forgive and he can use a sinner. All right, so we need to get past that. We need to look at deeds and actions. And the deeds and actions and, and, and the heart of wanting to be a good leader, wanting what's right, those are the things I see as the fruits of Donald Trump up until this point. He cares about this country. He wants to, he wants to do what he can do with the help of God to preserve it. And the only way it's the only way we're going to preserve it is if we put heat on every single religious leader that is not doing his or her job in a polite, respectful way, of course. If at all possible, you know, Christ actually had to go in and turn over the tables of the money changers. You know, sometimes in, in a figurative sense, you, we need to do that as well. But we need to put that. That's where a lot of the blame lies is with our religious leaders, not teaching the word of God, not following current events, not being involved in the policies of this nation. It's all about, that's part of, you can go to church and love God with all your heart and all your soul, right? Let's just say uh, you could you could do that and just stay there all the time. But there's still the other great commandment. And that's to love your neighbor as yourself. And to love your neighbor as yourself, you have to be a watchman for your neighbor. You have to, you have to pay attention to what the heck is going on to our country. And you have to educate yourself, especially if you're a pastor. You can't just say, well, I'm not political. I don't pay attention. I don't get involved. Part of, I'm going to say that again. Part of loving your neighbor as yourself is, is paying attention to the policies that govern our nation. And standing against the wicked forces, such as all these protests we're seeing that are organized by George Soros and others trying to divide and destroy our country. Again, pastors, you need to know what the heck is going on. You can't just hide out in your church building trying to do good deeds and, and, and just talk about personal salvation. We need to take the whole counsel of God into account. You know, when you look at the Bible, it is written many, uh, most of it's written from a nationalistic standpoint with the nation of Israel. You know, and the, and the prophets, who did they go to? They went to the political leaders and the religious leaders and gave them the warning. What did Jesus do? He went to the polit or he went to the religious leaders primarily, but there was politics involved as well um, among the nation at that time. The point is, we cannot just totally separate politics from religion. The word politics itself means the policies of those who govern. God's word is full of policies. Now, of course, ultimately the kingdom of God is its policies that are supposed to govern our hearts. But there still are the laws of God to govern those who are not who who, who have not chosen to be under the new covenant. To have the Holy Spirit govern their hearts. They need the law to tell them, thou shalt not do. So policy is important. We're not just free for all and uh, through this and hoping for the best. 
We love our neighbor. We want to protect them. And we have to see evil tides when they come and call them out for what they are. Ten verse one of Ezra. Now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, okay, they're confessing for marrying these pagan wives, all right? Ezra didn't do it, but he's praying for the country. Now think about this. You could take this on a personal level as well as a national level. Right now, our country, let's just say about half of our country, is steeped into paganism, leftist ideologies wanting to build a global utopia without our Lord Jesus Christ and we really need we need to figure out a way to combat and defeat and we cannot we cannot join hand in hand with those people we have to find out ways to defeat them politically as well as um, by speaking the truth, by education, by expo- by shedding the light upon darkness and pulling those out that can be pulled out. But we're at a state we're at a state where we cannot compromise with them. And it's evident. Now there are some that would be you know uh, people that call themselves Democrats that might be somewhat reasonable. but I'm talking about this liberal, crazy movement that's going on today, you know, the protesting and the hating of Christians, the hating of Donald Trump, the the hating of America, the hating of everything that's right and just, everything that is clean and moral. So here we go. And when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, There assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. Now picture Ezra. He's, you know, he's weeping before God because of their sins. We ought to all be like an Ezra today. Our nation has, our nation's sins have reached up to heaven. Just look at what's going on out there. We need to we need to repent. We need to pray for our nation. And should have enough care and love to weep for our nation at times. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God. And have taken strange wives, pagan wives, of the people of the land. Yet yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. You know, we say there is hope. We have an idea, we have a plan on how we can deal with this. And I would say this, there is hope in America today. But here's the answer. Verse 3. Now therefore... Let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. So here's he's saying the solution is that they annul their marriages with these pagan wives. They were unlawful in the first place, Deuteronomy chapter 7. So I don't know if you'd technically call this a divorce or what, but these were unlawful marriages. And I believe we're at this, this, we are at this point today in America. We have to divorce ourselves from liberal leftist pagan ideologies. A complete break. No compromise. We must separate it from America. It's a cancer. It's a disease. As Proverbs says, it's bringing us right to hell. 
It's bringing us to the brink of destruction. Verse 4, Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. Just do it. You know how hard this must have been for some of these men? Some of them had children. But you know what? They did it because they they knew it was wrong. They were repenting. And they knew that for the survival of their nation, it had to be done. Now, we know that pagan, that leftist ideology is wrong. We know that abortion is wrong. We know that same-sex marriage is wrong. We know that radical feminism is wrong. We know that um, mass immigration of peoples from third world countries who want to change our culture is wrong. You name it. We know that trying to build a global new world government or a global government, a new world order, is wrong. In our lives, in our personal lives, we've got to divorce ourselves from paganism. It creeps in, I'm telling you. You look at all the, a lot of the shows geared, geared towards children today, it's paganism, my friends. Much of it's paganism put forth by Hollywood and all. It, it, it's totally, they're totally trying to capture the minds of our youth and to totally destroy our culture once and for all. And now we're, at it, we're in an epic battle. We haven't won. We got Donald Trump elected, but we have not won the battle. God expects us to continue the fight, to pray, uh, to fast, to you know, to teach the truth, to to carry our own burdens in getting God's work done. We can't sit back and think Donald Trump is going to save us. Yes, God can use him to do miraculous things. But we have to do our part. Verse 4, Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. Okay, we taught, we read that. Okay, so here, this brings up a question. I'm going to touch on it here briefly. Uh, what should I do if I'm married to an unbeliever? Well, first of all, if you're a believer and you're unmarried, don't even think about it for a second. Do not marry an unbeliever. Do not marry someone who does not love the word of God, that does not want God to govern your relationship in your life. Because you are inviting trouble. I've seen it happen over and over again. Where somebody says, well, I just they're a nice person. They're, well, they're good looking. They might have this going for them or that going for them. Maybe I'll change them in the long run. It's not a good idea, my friends. But if you became a Christian after being married and your husband or your wife is, is an unbeliever still, here are the instructions on how to handle that. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked to... Well, actually, that'll be in a second here. But here's another scripture that has to do with what I was just saying. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? All right, that's that. This has to do with this is why we have to divorce ourselves from leftist ideologies because they come from paganism. They come from these the the darkness of Satan. And what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? All right, you know it's amazing how that um, the left get so alarmed when we want to protect our Christian heritage in America. 
and how that we do not want America to be flooded with with innumerable innumerable amounts of Muslims and other peoples from third world countries bringing their cultures here. But yet, if yet as far as Muslim countries are concerned, they don't give two thoughts about uh, what they're doing to preserve their Islamic heritage there. You know, they go even as far as uh, torturing and 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 beheading non-Muslims. And yet the left says nothing about them. You know, I wish they would just, uh, I wish they would go over there and protest. I wish they would get plane tickets and go over there and protest. And if they were lucky enough to come back alive, maybe, Maybe then, and I don't know, that's, that's a far, you know, with these people's, the way their brains are wired and how deceived they are. Maybe, maybe then they would appreciate the fruits that a Christian culture, the fruits of freedom that a, a Christian culture has afforded them. Okay, here's how we deal, here's how you would deal with, um, um, and it, a spouse that is uh, an unbeliever. But to the rest, uh, uh, first, going back to 1 Corinthians now, 7 verse 12. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife, this, this is Paul's opinion here. He says, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Okay, this isn't according to the law, but this is, Paul's view of what a person should do under the new covenant, in the new covenant era. All right. He says, he says, don't divorce her. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if it be and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were the children unclean. But now they are holy. In other words, a, a believing spouse can actually, uh, the positive thing about it is that they can make the, uh, bring, the Christian, uh, bring the children up in the Lord. They can bring the children up in Christianity. When, if they were to leave their spouse, that would, uh, that may or may not be the case. First Corinthians seven verse fifteen. But, but here's the qualification here. Here's the um, stip. You know, the if here. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. In other words, if you have a husband or a wife that's an unbeliever and they don't, and, and they're trying, there's another scripture that says, if they're trying to get in your way of serving and loving the Lord, then there are grounds for divorce then. And if they decide they're going to leave and they're not happy with you, um, do not, you, you are not obligated to try to save that marriage. Let me say that again. If you are a believer and you are married to an unbeliever, if they want to leave you, if they want to get divorced, you are not obligated to save that marriage. You may be better off allowing them to leave and then later on, you know, equally yoking yourself with a, with a believer. In marriage. All right. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? All right. So if they want to stay with you, there's a chance you might be able to finally bring them to the Lord. All right. That's the point there. So it's not, uh, there is a, under the new covenant, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of leniency as far as um, 
um, marriage to an unbeliever, if you would. Um, as uh, Of course, as long as they don't take your heart away from God. Anyways, on an individual level, any, anyhow. Back to Ezra. Ezra chapter uh, 10, verse 5. Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests, the Levites, and all Israel to swear that they should do according to this word. And they swore. All right, they agreed to put away their pagan wives. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Johanan, the son of Eliashib. And when he came in thither, he did eat no bread nor drink water, for he mourned because of the transgression of them that had been carried away. And they made proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem unto all the children of, of the captivity that they should gather themselves together unto Jerusalem. All right, they're gonna get everybody they're gonna get everybody together and have a big meeting here and tell them what's gonna happen, what, what their choices are. And that whosoever would not come within three days, according to the counsel of the princes and the elders, all his substance should be forfeited and himself separated from the congregation of those that had been carried away. They would, In other words, if they didn't get to this meeting, they would lose everything. They would be kicked out of this society, if you would. This nation. Think about that. Think about that. All right, then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. All right, they 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 heard they got the message and they got there. It was the it was the ninth month on the twentieth day of the month, and all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of the matter, and for the great rain. All right, um, I guess uh, supposedly this was the cold rainy season in Jerusalem. So this this would enhance the uh, the um, the sadness here. The sadness. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, You have transgressed. You've sinned and you have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. You know what? There's supposedly a, a, a big movement by of California to secede from the union. Part of me says, you know what? Maybe this biblical principle applies. Maybe we ought to divorce ourselves from California. Maybe cutting our loss there would be a good thing because California, um, uh, and I'm sorry to anybody, any of you good people that live in California, uh, this this would this wouldn't be good for you, but but um, that would take some of the weight off of us when it comes to elections, you know, because they carry a lot of electoral votes. And, um, v you know, uh, it would take away a lot of their uh, liberal representatives from Congress. Maybe that'd be a good thing. Maybe we would, maybe we will see a little bit of, I mean, if we can't defeat them ideologically, the only thing really that's left is to divorce them. To consolidate ourselves. And to get away from them. You know, when you look when you look at the map of the counties that were won by Donald Trump this last election, I mean, most of America was red for Donald Trump, while the some of these highly some of these big liberal lit, uh, some big city liberal states, there were sparsely little blue spots around. Maybe if we can't 
figure out a solution and they're going to riot and everything. If we can't conquer them ideologically and if they cannot submit to the, um, you know, the, our culture and our way of life without trying to disrupt it, without trying to destroy it, maybe we ought to figure out a way to divorce ourselves from them. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so we must do. Now, now, again, why were they trying why why did Ezra say they have to get rid of these strange wives, these pagan wives? Because that would contaminate their culture. It would lead the, the, their sons away from God. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. Think about that. How many of you, um, you know, get caught up watching some of this raunchy stuff that's produced by Hollywood? Think about it and other things. Have you separated yourselves from practice from participating with, in paganism with the pagans of this land? Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. All right, they agreed to it. And, they, and now he says, um, okay, they agreed to it. Notice one thing they did before um, they agreed to it. They confessed. We have to confess our sins before God. We have to repent as a nation. Just like they did. That was a that the the this remnant that went back to restore this nation. They repented of their sins and they separated themselves from those sins. And they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month. And among the sons of the priests there were found that had taken strange wives, namely of the sons of Jeshua, the the son of Josedek, and his brethren, uh, Masiah, and Eleazar, and Jerob, and Gedaliah. So what we're going to see here, there's going to be a huge list, I should say huge, a list of a, a... I believe it's approximately 113 uh, people that had taken strange wives. Now, all right, well, well, we'll leave it at that. But if you go through, or if you want to read on your own this list of names, it's basically the naughty list. I mean, I, I, I would not want my name on this list I mean, think about that, having your name in this list in the Bible for all times. I mean, that that would be the list that you wouldn't want to be on. You know, the hey, the book of life, that'd be great. That'd be great. But to have my name in the list of those people who had taken pagan wives, uh, then not, not so much great. Everybody would always know what you did. All right. Anyways, um, so we're going to skip through all those names here. Um, And uh, actually, I went from 12 all the way down to uh, 17. And they made an end. Okay. And among... Okay, we read that. Did I miss a few verses here? I think I might have. Let me just double check here. My slides got kind of goofed up there. Um... Now the okay, now we see here. Did we get first 14? No, we didn't. Okay. I thought we were missing something. Okay, so I'm going to read it out loud. I'm, I apologize if the verses aren't on the screen there. But um, it says, Now let now our rulers of the congregation stand, and let all of them which have taken strange wives in our cities come at an appointed times, and with them the elders of every city and the judges thereof, until the fierce wrath of our God for this matter be turned from us. 
Only Jonathan, the son of uh, Asael and Jezehiah, okay, and um, uh, the son of Tikva were employed about this matter. And Meshulam and Shab- uh, Shabbathiah, the Levite, helped them. And the children of the captivity did so, and Ezra the priest with the with the uh, certain chief of the fathers, after the house of their fathers, and all of them by their names, were separated and sat down in the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter. Okay, They called people, uh, they got a group organized here, and... Uh, and uh, they are getting organized as to investigate this matter and to set things right. And then, um, and then we get to verse seventeen. Okay, so I read those filling verses again. I apologize. And uh, and they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives. And there were the and then the list starts from verse eighteen. Um, and then. Uh, yeah, 19, it says, And they gave their hands that they would put away their wives. And being guilty, they offered a ram of the flock for their trespass. And of the sons of Immer, Heniah, and Zebediah. And of the sons of Haram, Masiah, and Elijah, and Shemiah, and Jeliah, and Uzziah. Um, the sons of Pasher, so on and so forth. And of the Levites. All right, so we got this list of names here. Um, And then it says at the end here, all these, okay, there was a whole long list of names of about 113 names. All these had taken strange wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. So this was a very painful separation here. And perhaps in America, um, we need to make a painful separation. I don't know how that would look, how that would work, um, but it, and I'm, if we don't win over these people's hearts, and if we don't combat the uh, the um, mainstream media that's trying to brainwash the people, um, I don't know what's going to happen to our country. But what I do know, we can take care of for sure, right away, right here and now is to repent for paganism that has creeped into our lives. False ideologies. And and get rid of them. Separate ourselves from them. Start with your life and then clean out your house, your family, and get your house in order. I should say get our houses in order. Because if we start there, then we can hopefully keep praying and, 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 and reaching out with the gospel and trying to win, uh, the, win the souls of men for the kingdom of God. And in turn, stay the judgment of God's hand upon our country, if it be his will. Anyways, hey. I hope you enjoyed that study. I hope you enjoyed this entire book of Ezra. It was a pleasure studying it, studying it, and sharing uh, and sharing it with you. Um, next, we get into the book of Nehemiah, and that's all about the same stuff. And we're going to get specifically talk specifically about the wall, the rebuilding of the wall. And you know what? We we hear a lot about rebuilding a wall or building a wall in America, and rebuilding walls to protect our nation. And it is so exciting. We are living in an amazing time. Make sure that you stay in prayer. Because things are so volatile and we need God's help during these days. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. We thank you so much for this great book of Ezra and all the types and the examples that we can learn from and apply to our personal lives as well as the life of our nation. Even if you're, if you're listening and you don't live in America, these apply to your nations as well. Be an Ezra, be an Ezra, be a Zerubbabel, be a Joshua and call for the restoration of your nations. 
Um, Father, we thank you so much. We pray for the protection of our leaders. We pray that you give them wisdom. We pray that we can combat and defeat the leftist ideologies, the, the Chuck Schumers and others that are purposely trying to destroy our country and to bring us into a global pagan new world order. We love you. Ask for, again, we ask for your protection in Jesus' name. Amen. Christian Overcomers is brought to you by the tithes and offerings of our listeners. If you'd like to support our ministry, please go to ChristianOvercomers.com. God bless you, and thank you for your support. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He is loose the faithful lightning of his terrible sword. His truth is marching.